Welcome back to He Said, She Said. Coach, I know you're really excited about our next guest. Why don't you tell us a little more about her? Well, I had a show for a number of years called The Business of Life, and uh, Mary Shirtliff was like my, my most popular guest of all time. She got the phone to ring. I think, Mary, you and I, welcome welcome to Santa Clarita. How are you, my dear? Mary, where are you? Yes. Welcome hi, to folks. Santa Clarita. How are you? I was just bragging on you. Can you hear me? I can. So I was just bragging on you. So I remember one day we had 43 phone calls in an hour. It broke the all-time record. So you're going to come back many times. But today we're going to talk about a subject that I can't even talk about anymore because I'm going to start crying when I think about my grandfather. Unfinished business. (laughs) So I'm going to let you and Ellen explain, or Elle, you explain, Ellen Tunick, you explain to our audience what you think unfinished business is. Well, my mother passed away quite some time ago, but actually for, I would say, the the next 18 months, I didn't really know what I was feeling. Um, I knew I was feeling loss. Uh, I knew that the uncertainty of going through life uh, without my anchor, my mom, uh, scared me. Um, I was sad. I, you know, I didn't really know where to go. After I actually went through that process, um, then I got really upset because I felt that there was so much that I didn't do because I was scared when she was in failing health that I wish I could have gone back and been there for her like my sister was for my mom. And that, that was my unfinished business for several years. Mary, are you there? Mary, Mary. She's in yes, yes. Yeah. So I'm having a hard time hearing you, but um, I'd like to add upon that. About a year ago, my mom as well passed away, and just uh, building on what Ellen said, I, I went into a sabbatical. I couldn't work. I couldn't seem to keep a, a train of thought going. And so I have taken the last year just to really work on – I'm finishing up the business with my mom. When she passed away, um, she was actually supposed to come live with me and um, within two weeks, and she died two weeks before she was going to be in with to, to live with me, and I almost felt like she had died on purpose hmm. just so that we didn't, she didn't have to live with me because we'd had this little tumultuous relationship throughout our life. And it really, through this last year, I've been in physical pain, And I had to start looking at the physical pain and going back to that emotional pain of loss, abandonment, anger, um, all of that. And I couldn't believe, because I'm in the field, I work with people every day, and I understand how a lot of this works as a hypnotherapist as well as feng shui um, teacher and facilitator. And my physical body just took a painful hit. Did yours do that, Ellen? Um, I do, I do remember not really caring about the physicality of my life and myself because I was so consumed with my own personal sadness, uh, and loss. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I know that I actually gained a lot of weight during that period Mm -hmm. of time. Mm -hmm. Um, I probably, I, I don't remember physically hurting but I do remember not taking care of myself on a physical basis. You know, as your daughter, that for you, I believe, though, that part was actually so short-lived because what you did realize what was going on, it actually made you regain control of your life. After that. It took a couple months. It took, it took more than just a couple of months because for the first three months after my mother passed, um, I did nothing but cry myself to sleep and figure out, mm-hmm. how do I do this? And you still had to take care of your father. Your father was still And there. my father was still alive and didn't want to be here. So that was a whole other subject matter. And your husband had no clue. And my husband had no clue. Uh, there know, w- wasn't did, a lot you know. of empathy going on. I didn't really know who to turn to. I didn't want to turn to my children. Uh, no one has a relationship with their parent like the child. So to expect anybody to understand what you're going through unless they have actually experienced the loss of a parent is unrealistic. What I found through my loss as well was that each one of us, there was five children, each one of us had a different perception of our relationship with our mother. And it was even hard to reach out to my siblings 
because their relationship was actually different than mine. And I had to go, you know, like I said, I took this year's sabbatical, and I had to get very clear on what my issues were around my mom and finishing up this unfinished business that I thought I had another five, ten years to, you know, work with once she comes to live with me. And I had to get clear again then on my emotions, what emotions was I feeling. You know, there was anger, there was shame, there was guilt, of course. And, of course, I loved her. I loved my mother more than anything in the world. And so when she left, there was that void. And I just... Did she know, did she know, Mary? Because as that person passes, you no longer have that physical ability to connect with them. Right. And so I had to go into the spiritual world and write her some letters and really get clear on what my emotions are and what my need for that approval still was and why I was feeling so abandoned. And, and it was, um, and then with the feng shui, of course, I had to go back into my home and change up some of the, um, things that I'd made in my home for her specifically when she was moving in. And she died very quickly of a pneumonia. She passed away in five days of this. She was diagnosed and passed away in five days. So we were totally, I was totally blindsided and I had already started putting her bedrooms together and pictures on the wall. And so when I walked into her room and into my house, she haunted me at every step. Mm. And so I had to actually pull all of that back, redo all of that, and use the feng shui training that I had to actually move forward into the future. And when I started doing that, my back and legs and feet literally were so sore I could barely walk. All right. And it was moving into the future without her. For both of you, we've got a couple of minutes left on, on, on this segment. How, how do you go forward? How did both of you go forward? Well, I, you know, for me, um, my family support, um, fortunately, I have children that are very supportive, two happen to be psychologists, that doesn't hurt, um, and, you know, just, I talked a lot about it, but it took me m- my own time going within myself to understand the difference between unfinished business and regret, and I think those are, are two different, two different feelings. Um, and it took me a really long time to decipher for myself what those two feelings really were. Mm -hmm. Mary, what, what I had to do was start to become mindful of what day I was at the hours and the minutes, because I had lost almost a whole whole year in my memory. And I had to get really clear on, on what Ellen just said on what my unfinished business was with my mother, things that I had not said that I wished I had, regrets that I had, guilt that I had. I wasn't an easy child, you know, growing up. And even as an adult, I wasn't an easy child. And I had to learn to eat the elephant one bite at a time instead of looking at the whole picture of pain and depression and her loss. I had to start breaking it down into the happy times and some of the sad times. And then, again, I went into the home and started looking at my home to see how I had created that canvas from my guilt, from my regret, from my depression, and start making it happy and full of joy around that memory again. All right, my dear. We got it. We got it. We're going to go to a hard break, but give me 10 seconds. You're going to come back in a couple weeks, and we might pick this up because it's such a big subject. Everybody, I think. Well, and there's unfinished regret with more than just your your parents. It's friendships. Yeah. It's uh, I divorces. That. Yeah. It's, it's everything. I yeah. experienced that up in Oregon yeah. a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Tammy's got a story. Tammy will be back. We're going to take a break here. Mary will be back in a couple of weeks. Mary does something that I've never seen anybody else do, and when she comes back, not today, but in two weeks, you give her you give her your birth date and the time of day you were born, she'll tell you what's going on in your life. And she I'm is, too old. Oh, I don't excited. remember. It's unbelievable. <laughs> want, it's unbelievable what you can one. do, Mary. Thank, thank you. God thank bless you. you. See you in a couple you. weeks, girl. Oh, thank God you. God bless you, Ellen and Coach, and I love you both. Thank Thanks, you, Mary. Mary. All right. KHTS, I'm um, here with Rob and Tammy. Ellen, we'll be right back. We're going to finish up with a, a quick segment about raising kids. Who's raising our kids? Is, is technology? Who's raising your kids? Technology, Tammy? Yeah, iPads. Really? We'll be right back. (laughs) 
I have to say this, he said, she said, I love this. This is getting great. We're coming back with just a short thing here about raising kids, and I've got my dad right here to talk about that. Well, I, I, you and uh, Tammy are such great mothers. I don't need to patronize either, but you guys are doting mothers. You're there for your kids. I mean, you're, you're not – your kids aren't latchkey kids. Your, your kids know who their mothers are. How do you do it? I mean, how do you do it? Good partners, for one. Absolutely. That definitely helps. Good neighbors, good friends, family. Like we say, it takes a village. I mean, it's an old, an old saying. It takes a village to raise a family. You know, one of my best friends, I always tell her, I'm so glad you're in my village. Because there's a lot I couldn't do without the support of my family and my friends. I never see your kids growing up hitting a girl at a bar. I mean, I, I went on Facebook. Can you Facebook the coach, Coach Ron Tunick? Please Facebook me. But doesn't it start in the home? I mean, it's, you know, when you go back in this this kid that I don't even mention his name, give him any credit, that hits this girl in the bar. He's, he's oh. this. Yeah. yeah. Doesn't it start in the home, ladies? I I I think it does. I it made has to. a decision on my career as a teacher, so I would be home the same time the kids were. Ra- I would, raising your children. I was raising. I didn't want the babysitters to instill their beliefs into my. Or, or even I know I know there are working parents that have to. They absolutely. have to be at work for hours. But, you know, absolutely. I actually did daycare for years when I was younger. And I was with these children way more than their parents were within a day. And that's when I sure. made that same decision as you're saying that I wanted to be there. I wanted to be the one raising my kids. I, yeah, I did too. So I chose my career path mm-hmm. based on these children that I didn't even have yet. Right. That's why I became a teacher. It's, well, I, I'm con- it's I a mean, very difficult it's a huge time subject. for for families yeah. today. Uh, it was difficult for different reasons when we were raising our children. But today, probably every generation that you see, it becomes more and more difficult to raise healthy, quote, well, normal I can, I can tell children. you who's watching my daughter right now as she's sitting here in the radio station with us. And the iPhone 6 mm-hmm. is actually babysitting her right now. Yeah. <laughs> my, I have friends, Whatever actually. Works. Friends are watching my children right now. And then I know, I know they're safe and they're being engaged and they're not just sitting, hopefully, they're you know, do, they're playing video something. games. They're, they're getting some activity going on, so they're not bouncing off the walls when I leave here. <laughs> but it's a huge subject, which we will talk about through the summer, because uh, it, it, it's a societal problem that's getting worse and worse. And Santa Cruz is, uh, we live in a bubble. I really believe this is a very special community. We're, we are special because I think that we have a family-oriented community that, for the most part, we care about our families. We care about our children. We care about our neighbors. Our, yes, if we know them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that we're going to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, actually, everybody. No, go, that, go next that's door a neighbor. subject for in the next week or two because uh, I, I don't know our neighbors. You know our next door neighbor. I do because I ask them to bring in our trash when we go on vacation. <laughs> All right, you're listening to He Said, She Said. Uh, this is our first, our main show. Uh, hopefully you like it. We want to thank you for coming to KHTS uh, 1220. Ellen and I want to thank you, and Robin want to thank you for sharing, letting us share our thoughts, our day with you. Uh, Hopefully you like some of the topics. Don't forget to download the KHTS app, 1220 in the App Store. It's really a cool app, and there's a lot of stuff at KHTS. Go ahead. Um, We're going to close today uh, with this particular message. Make truth your number one priority and gather enough strength to stand in your truth and please honor who you are. All right, guys, catch us next Saturday, 1 p.m. He said, she said, KHTS 1220. Have an amazing day, everyone.